Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So the three of us have been hashing around this idea of living a marginal life, you know, living between the seams of what the culture might think of as a successful life. We often have clients who come in and are really having a struggle. They're having a struggle launching the kind of career they want. Sometimes they struggle even wanting a career. And as we're, we're wrestling with the underpinnings of it, we naturally find ourselves talking about the puer and the puella archetype and something that Jung wrote extensively about, which is the idea that the inner child and the dynamics of the inner child can capture people and prevent them from taking an, a next stage. This can look like a lot of different things in the consulting room, but it feels useful to kind of boil it down to a couple of central difficulties. Yeah. I mean, there's so much to say about this topic and there is some overlap with this idea of the puer and the puella with the idea of dependent narcissism as well, which we've touched on in a previous podcast. So what are we really talking about here? First of all, puer and puella are the Latin words respectively for boy and girl. You know, another colloquial way of talking about it is a Peter Pan complex people who just don't want to grow up. And oftentimes these people are very charming. They're fun to be around, but they have difficulty really sticking themselves to something and actualizing something. And as the years go by, I mean, a puer is a lot of fun, maybe in the twenties and thirties, but that person who doesn't really quite manage to create firm stance for himself. It starts looking not so good in the 50s or 60s. It's costly. It's costly yeah. in very real ways. And often that can be a turning point that people do hit midlife, 40s and 50s, and then a kind of observing quality, if they're lucky, constellates in them and then begins to say, wait a minute, you know, what have I been in service to for the last 50 years? What do I have to show for it? And is that okay with me? I'm really resonating to what you're saying about how costly it is. Because on the one hand, you know, when I think of Peter Pan, I think, ah, you know, kind of a cool life, get to fly around and uh, battle with the crocodile and Captain Hook. And what's wrong with that? But the problem is that the price is not having a full life. It, and it is um, what you said at the outset, Joseph, it's a kind of marginal life because a developmental trajectory is meant to ground us in ongoing stages of development from childhood to young adult and going out in the world and testing our mettle and making commitments, saying goodbye to the protected and ideal fantasied world of childhood, of all those possibilities that I could be when I grow up. Um, well, when you grow up, you have to pick one or pick two, and it's going to be harder, and it's going to be a little more multidimensional, and it's going to be deeper and richer as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about sometimes my image for this when clients come in is that, you know, at some point in life, it's appropriate to be sort of in the ante room of life with lots of doors to choose from. But at some point, you have to walk through one of those doors. Otherwise, you risk staying in life's ante room. And when you walk through one door, you effectively forego all of the others. So it is a sense of accepting a kind of limitation 
turning your back on possibilities. But if you stay in the ante room, it may seem like you're leaving open all these kinds of rich possibilities, but really you're making this an unconscious sacrifice. You know, the fairy tale that I'm thinking of, based on your image of the ante room, is Rapunzel, uh, who stayed up in her tower, and the the witch uh, figure comes and uh, brings her food, and uh, they have a relationship. And uh, Rapunzel's inner world is presumably fairly contented until the prince comes along and sings to her from the bottom, and life calls her. But while she's in that ante room up in the tower, you know, all these rich fantasy possibilities are before her. And when she finally uh, yields to the prince's call, the call of life, the call of a bond, breaking out of her protected tower, she does suffer. Life is much harder, and yet it is more real and more full, more substantial. But does call us to sacrifice our childhood and our fantasies, and it calls us to become ordinary, Mm -hmm. no longer a princess, but down there in the forest trying to make a go of it. There's a quote, actually, that I have here by Marie-Louise von Franz, who wrote a book called Puer Eternus that I think touches right on what you're saying, Deb. She says... That is the drawback of getting in touch with reality, because in that way, one becomes limited. There are restrictions. One comes to the miserable human situation where one's hands are tied, and it is not possible to do as one would like, something which is particularly disagreeable to the puer eternus. What one produces is always miserable compared with the fantasies one had lying in bed dreaming about what one would do if one could. So this is an ancient theme. You know, fairy tales have been around for hundreds, maybe even longer years, and they stay alive in the psyche. I think in modern culture, sometimes the idea of Grimm's fairy tales and other things fade away, but then they resurface. And one of the places that this exact situation resurfaces is in the movie The Matrix, where, you know, humanity is being, you know, cocooned in this fantastical world. Um, They don't even know how their energy is being siphoned off for the machines. And the goal is to reach Morpheus. And if you reach Morpheus, he sits there in this chair with his looking very cool with the sunglasses. And he says, it's your choice. You know, the red pill is going to wake you up It's going to be a life of hard knowledge and desperate freedom and struggle, but you're going to be in reality. Or you could take the blue pill. You'll go back to sleep. You'll have this security and tranquility and and this ignorance, and, and you'll live in this illusion. So here's the moment of choosing. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And this idea of red pill and blue pill, that that has like shot through the collective culture. And a lot of young people, you know, talk about this, particularly young men, really talk about red pill or blue pill. What are you going to do? Right. And in some sense, the choice of the blue pill is a choice to stay stuck in an innocence complex where you have no responsibility. And that is lovely and it's comforting, but at the same time, you never become real. Right. So you have fantasy challenges, i.e. the gaming world, that you know, we can spend six hours a day, you know, some young people gaming, and they have this feeling of adrenaline as if they're facing challenges, and they have to be clever. You know, these manipulating these games are pleasurable, but in the final analysis, I mean, I have some wonderful young people who are in this moment you know, at the end of the day, I put down the gaming console and I'm suddenly realizing like, I don't have crap in my life. Like what, what am I doing? And that feels like, you know, okay, someone's beginning to tolerate the red pill, but we can feel as if in the fantasy life of, of gaming and other things, as if we've actually accomplished something. That's a very, very interesting thing that, uh, we can experience our inner world 
uh, so intensely that I won in this game. We, we, I launched a raid or whatever heroic thing it was. I won the battle. And I bet that to take the other pill must feel like being trapped in a drab reality of the drab reality of, you know, get up and get dressed and go to work and bring home a paycheck must feel like a trap versus the realm of all these infinite possibilities and falling prey to the great feelings that you have in the realm of possibility and fantasy versus life and work and relationships. I mean, you said it feels like a trap. I think it feels like a sacrifice. And at some point, we have to be willing to make the sacrifice. I'm particularly interested in this topic because occasionally I will get someone with this psychology in my practice. And, you know, they're always really interesting people. Usually the work with them doesn't go particularly well in that they don't wind up changing in the way that they identified that they wanted to change when they came in to see me. And it's often this sense that they they will not make the required sacrifice that would be necessary for them to finally commit to a marriage, for example. Uh, I wonder if it's very hard to see what the benefit of the sacrifice is. Uh, Oh, I I give this up for commitment to a career path or a marriage or some other thing. And it must, I imagine, feel very much like all loss and no gain and uh, being bound to some kind of dutiful, prescriptive path that has been laid out and that's going to be just an endless chore, rather than an opportunity for inner development and growth and finding something more in yourself versus the fantasy world or having something provided for you. One of the things that's coming up for me, Deb, as you're talking, is this cultural poison for me that has become so common that people aren't really looking at it, which is you have a bunch of young people who, instead of turning inside themselves, trying to track where the water of life is flowing, they're sitting down with their parents and they're doing a cost-benefit analysis of which degree they should purchase from a university in order to secure you know, adequate funding looking forward, which often can be totally divorced from where the water of life is growing. And so they're back in that situation, Deb, which is, so the cost benefit analysis says, you know, I should be an, an accountant, let's say, but there's nothing in me, nothing is illuminated around the idea of being an accountant. So therefore, I'm gonna stay inside. I'm gonna take the blue pill. Because those are the only choices that it seems that life or my parents or myself can make. So we're also really talking about uh, sort of failed initiation. Or blocked initiation. I mean, Mm -hmm. in this realm, like the culture Mm -hmm. is inserting this totally alienating agenda into it. And it is absolutely cutting people off from the, the kind of magnetic life of desire that they would need to have the audacity to be put in a situation where they have to really fight for something. Yeah. I mean, two of the things that initiate us are desire and suffering. And if you've always had a life where you weren't allowed to really have either thing, then you never become initiated. And I think becoming initiated is being able to tolerate the sacrifice. And and I would even say that desire leads to sacrifice. I don't know if the desire is the sacrifice. But it gives us the juice to be able to fight and then come to the moment that we'll have to give up whatever it is we have to give up to have the prize. I'm thinking in a very literal way about those initiatory rights uh, that we've all heard about of the young men being, you know, sort of pounced upon in the middle of the night and, you know, dragged off into the the tundra or the desert or wherever it is and uh, get bitten by ants or, you know, some sort of other trials. And it's in all those hero tales as well. 
And then what happens? The young person goes back and re-enters the community as a man or as a woman. It has left the realm of childhood. It's a real marker uh, and has a sense of autonomy, a growth in ego strength. Well, also a sense of where he or she kind of fits in the community. There's a sense of purpose that comes with it. And that's often missing in someone that has a kind of puer puella psychology. They're often driven by a desire for safety and or pleasure. Mm -hmm. I have another quote here from my good friend, Marie Louise. It's just so great. Um, I really just love her. She says, this is also from Puer Aeternus. She says, you will find that if you give yourself to reality, you will be disillusioned and the end of it will be that you will meet death. If you accept your life, you really accept death in the deepest sense of the word. And that is what the Puer does not want. Let's jump into that. What does that look like in a life? Well, let, let's take the example of a woman who has never really committed to her marriage, for example. You know, maybe there's no real intimacy there. Maybe there's been a series of affairs and uh, there never were kids in the marriage because it, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't really that level of commitment. And so now, you know, she's in her late forties and the marriage is kind of on ice. The affairs are no longer so, uh, so interesting anymore or fulfilling. And, and there's just a sense of kind of emptiness. The opportunity to have kids has passed her by. Yes. And it's like, it's like her situation was never really accepted. And so there was a lot that was sacrificed against her will. It sounds like uh, what the result is, is a kind of psychic barrenness instead of real growth and fruitfulness, a sense of inner fruitfulness. If I have, I have done these things, I made this commitment, maybe, uh, you know, all of the, that kind of thing that results in really uh, a greenness internally versus the emptiness that comes up for me as a, as a descriptor in the context of this hypothetical person who sought pleasure and avoided the struggle and the sacrifice. Lisa, I want to just come back to the quote. I'm, I'm tracking you guys. Did Von Franz say that to choose life, to choose to come into life is to choose death? Is that what she said? I think that that is absolutely implied. So one of the things that came up in my mind as you were talking about this Puella life and marriage that I've certainly had women who very realistically, um, young women who noticed or were considering giving birth to children. And as they're sitting with that, they're thinking, you know, I'm going to wind up with stretch marks. My belly's going to be a mess. My breasts, after all this is over, are not going to look anything <laughs> remotely like what they look like now. And this kind of um, sacrificial moment that they're up against, that in order to incarnate the archetype of the mother, they have to put this archetype of, you know, Aphrodite, perhaps, you know, on the sacrificial altar and, and accept the fact of, that my body's going to look very different and I'm going to feel really different after, you know, I give birth to one or more children. And it's a choice. And, and one has to face this death of the puella. And by even having children, there is this implicit acceptance of, of mortality because this is the ongoing life that's going to surpass you. What dies is the, the youthful and unpenetrated young woman. You know, even if she's married, uh, pregnancy and childbearing and the pain of that is, is substantial. And in centuries past, women died in childbirth. It was very risky. Uh, but what do you get? Well, you get new life. You get the new life of your actual physical baby, and you get new life inside yourself with the feelings and the bonding and the physicality of, of living so much for this other little being. 
and you get to experience uh, lots of other feelings like fatigue at being up for the 10th night in a row at, at three o'clock in the morning, but you get the real. You know, and even if we're not talking about actually giving birth to a baby, there's this, there's this way that to really incarnate in this lifetime, we have to choose the particular. It's sort of like my rather silly metaphor about kind of life's ante room. If we never sacrifice potentials and we stay in the realm of the all possibility, then we never really come down into being into our own particular life. You know, there's an example from literature that really works for me when I think about this particular psychological uh, kind of constellation, and that is from Dickens' Bleak House. Those of you who are familiar with with the book may remember that the book revolves around a court case called Jarndyce and Jarndyce, and there's a big fortune at stake, and it's been tied up in this court for decades, I believe. And there's all these potential people who might wind up being the recipient of the fortune once it's decided. So there's a young man in the book named Richard. And Richard is uh, so uh, optimistic that he's going to be the recipient of the fortune. So he has an older mentor who's guiding him, who says very sensibly, Richard, you cannot count on this fortune. You need to come up with a career for yourself. So he sets Richard up, I think, in the law first, or I can't remember, maybe it's not the law, but in any case, maybe it's a doctor. So he's studying to be a doctor and he finds that it's just boring and tedious and he doesn't really like it. So he doesn't stick with it and he leaves it shortly thereafter. And then he's put in a law office and all he wants to do with the law office is try to learn more about this court case. And he just makes a bad job of that too because he doesn't because he he's never really trying to inhabit any of these situations because he's got this gigantic fantasy that he's going to be rescued from his ordinary plight by being the recipient of this money and then finally he tries the military anyway as you might imagine he um, completely wastes all of his money trying all these different things, never really settles into his life. And of course, the great irony at the end of the book is the fortune does get settled on him, but by the time the court fees are paid, there's no money left. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. That's a bitter pill. Yeah. But it's it's a real, I think it's a really great, uh, as Dickens can do, it's a really great encapsulation of what it can look like to be a puer is that you're always living in the realm of the fantasy and you never just come down and accept, really radically accept the what is. There's such a sadness in that of missing uh, the fullness of the real and the what is and the engagement with one's own self, one's own interiority. I go back to your example Joseph, of of living a life where you play a lot of games online, and that that too is terribly sad, of all these, the fantasies and the possibilities versus meeting oneself in so many more ways, in such a multidimensional way, and finding the core that has life in it, and being engaged in all the possible ways that include struggle and sacrifice and also give us the opportunity to individuate, which is what the puer or puella has truly sacrificed needlessly and pointlessly for something that is not real. And this pressure that human beings are designed to channel, which is this actualization of the internal images, that the self that lives in this inner place is in fact pressing upon the ego to be able to incarnate, as you had said, uh, Lisa, 
and for them to encounter the real world and to be alive in the outer world. And that is a, a kind of natural current for a human being. But then, then it begs the question that what's interrupted that natural flow, because we're kind of meant to just surrender to that incarnating impulse. Uh, the other thing I want to say, Lisa, is when you were talking about that movie and that I was landing it a bit in modern culture, I've noticed you know, a lot of young men who are resistant to letting go of compulsive gaming will then point to examples of you know the one or two guys that won a million dollars in a gaming competition or so-and-so who is making a career of putting up YouTube videos of how they've successfully negotiated points in the game. And that's like that uh, lottery fantasy that if if I tread in this fantasy long enough, this miraculous situation will manifest. And Deb, I'm still nursing something that I think is poignant about your description of the tribal initiation where the young boy at a certain point is is just gathered by the men and taken out into an initiatic experience. And I think, and I have encountered a number of young men, if they're really looking deep enough, they are hoping that something in life will carry them off, will abduct them from this really, what turns out to be a very painful life, if they're able to really confront it. And they want life, the tribe of men, or, or a girlfriend for that matter, to abduct them and get them out of their bedrooms. And since we don't have kind of modern initiations, yeah. I often feel like they're waiting for an archetype to activate in the psyche. And when an archetype does land powerfully in the psyche, it really does gather the libido, puts it into a theme, and charges it up so that there's a kind of uh, trajectory that the archetype can provide. And uh, we might say actually does in fact provide for many of us. We often do have a dominant archetype, at least in the first half of life, that really does kind of push us in a direction. Yeah. So we're talking about initiation. I'm also thinking about individuation. We One, one thing we could say perhaps about the puer or puella is that he or she has avoided becoming uh, individuated. It's like a failed individuation because the person has sort of stayed trapped in this kind of innocence complex, hasn't accepted their life, hasn't taken responsibility, and therefore they haven't brought forth much of that which is in them. So let's go back to this uh, idea, because I, I am seeing those people, you're seeing those people. What has obstructed them? If individuation is the natural state of mankind and the human structure of the psyche, what might have happened intrapsychically or environmentally, which has really thrown that off? Well, I mean, first of all, I think there's an argument to be had whether or not individuation is natural. You know, at one point, Jung said that it's an opus contra naturum. That is true. That's right. Sometimes it's discussed more like this is just a natural unfolding that we all go through. And, and sometimes it's discussed like this is a very rare thing. So I think the truth is that sometimes it's just easier. It's just easier to take the blue pill, as you pointed out, Joseph. I thought that was a lovely amplification to pull in that film. Lord knows it's easier. And, and there's a way that it's always a temptation to avoid suffering, isn't it? And also, I think uh, today, it's easier to avoid that suffering uh, because we do have games and conveniences and technology and a hundred other things that are out there for us. And what we don't have is a tribal community that says, hey, look, whether you like it or not, all the men are coming from the village to drag you out into the wild for your initiation experience or for a young woman, marriage and childbearing. So there is not the the community norms that really kind of pushed people into the next stage of growth and development. It, it has often has to come much more from within. And what if an archetype doesn't land? 
And I, I just want to clarify that, you know, someone could get married and have kids and still be a Puella. I have seen that, you know. So sometimes the outer situation in life looks like the person's doing the acceptable things, but it's it's really just an attitude. But I, I do want to say, and I, I think that this will bring us maybe full circle uh, around this topic, is Joseph, when you ask what blocks them, another way to think about it might be, what is the appeal? of being a puer or puella. And I think, especially again, when one is younger, being the high flying person who always chooses to do the adventurous, daring thing and never to be pinned down is very appealing. It's appealing to the person and it's usually very appealing to the people around them. I mean, these are the kinds of people that are a lot of fun. They often have very ebullient personalities they're kind of the life of the party. They're always good for a laugh. It's very entertaining and 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 fun. In some sense, who wouldn't choose that at least for part of the time? And I, I think that this brings up for me a couple things. First of all, there is a time in life when it's totally appropriate to be in life's waiting room looking at all of those doors and not walking through one. I've had people come in in my in their 20s and and you know say with a boyfriend is pressuring them to to get married and and settle down and she doesn't want to and I'm like, "Well, you're 24. Like you could you could really just go have some fun, you know." But the other thing is uh, that this this character of the puer, it is an archetype. The puer iternus is an archetype, and there's a positive pole and a negative pole. The positive pole is the thing that you mentioned in your introduction, Joseph, which is the child. You know, the child archetype is an incredibly numinous archetype that contains within it this image of futurity and the promise of new life. And so there is a lot there that's deeply attractive. So so it feels like there's a lot of things that are kind of glued together in our conversation. So I just want to parse them out for my own thinking as well, that you're right, that when the puer activates, you know, we could wind up leading a kind of Elon Musk life. It's visionary, lots of risk-taking, perhaps even cavalier, but if the ideas you're bringing forward have legs on them, and if there is a way they could be incarnated, and we surround ourselves with kind of manifesting people, you know, something big could happen in that way. So I think when we're talking about this unincarnated puer, we're really talking about, you know, this latency versus activation, that there's, there's, there is an unactivated problem in some puers and puellas. And so, as you were saying, Deb, there's a question about what induces activity, activation, and whether that's desire, like with Rapunzel, it might be sexual awakening. You know, as, as a young boy moves from 11 years old to 14 years old, he goes from thinking girls are irrelevant you know, and, and, and a problem, just get away from me. And all of a sudden, because of this sexual awakening, you know, at 14, just that primal urgency moves them into this terrain and the awkwardness of it and everything they have to learn about engaging a woman. So in Rapunzel, you know, this courting of the prince kind of arouses something about the sexual and the desire nature, but she really did need the prince to show up. She really did need something to beckon her and to arouse her in a way. So when we think about the really sleepy, underactualized person, and of course all the consequences of that, that something hasn't aroused them adequately to pull them in a direction, whether that's initiation, sexuality, whether it's an archetype, whether it's a fantasy about their life, which, which, by the way, one of the things that some of the analysts talk about is the maternal reverie about their children's future and how that has a kind of activating intrapsychic potential. And fathers who introduce their children to the world, 
you know, in the ancient world, you were a little boy and you were, you know, you were walking around and you could lift something. You were working the bellows for your dad, who was the blacksmith. There was this kind of dr- pulling you into activity and introducing you to life. So uh, part of it very well could be modern culture. It could be all of these opportunities like gaming to disappear into, a, you know, an astral world. And then we're never put adequately into the context to sacrifice or even want to sacrifice because there's nothing desired, adequately desired. So as we're hashing it out, I'm finding this curiosity about the many things and complicated things that interrupt the flow of desire or even misdirect it into a fantastical world rather than allowing it to flow to outer objects, which are worth pursuing. Right. I mean, it could flow to outer objects like, you know, a new lover or a different car or the next trip or something. What allows desire to kind of settle into a steady groove that creates the opportunity for us to root ourselves in our own lives? Yes, that we want to experience it with a full sensual encounter. So one of the other ways that people can fail to launch. uh, I see this very much with young men, even in their 20s, that they've had all of this kind of exposure to pornography and their sexuality is is a self-exciting habit. And they're looking at these pictures, moving pictures of women who, by the way, only provide verbal and visual stimulus. And it's shocking to some of these young men when I ask them, well, where are all the other senses. Like, do you realize that women have a certain scent? And uh, when you kiss a woman, that there's a taste in that. And there's an unexpected reality of where a woman might touch you on your body that you can't predict the way that you are predictable in masturbating. So there's this enormous missing realm of all the senses being involved, which some young men don't even realize is missing from their perception of what's possible. It's like being colorblind and then someone introduces you to to green, which you never saw before. And you're like, oh my God. And I think sometimes the external world can be disappointing. Uh, And then you retreat back. And then you retreat back that what I, for example, in quotes have imagined in my fantasy life is is richer and more magical than my encounter with a boyfriend or or a girlfriend. Well, fantasies are always unlimited. That's right. And I'm still back on what you said, Joseph, that I thought was so profound about what blocks desire from its inherent path toward actualization in the outer world of a real substantial engagement with with other people, with tasks, and and with one's own psyche. And uh, it's a very big and deep uh, question. So how much of that is environmental deficits? Uh, How much of that is you know, uh, the derailing of desire into a fantasy life, and that what would then allow libido to pool enough so that there's a, an inner pressure and, and a gradient for it to flow down so that it connects with, with something that is real and more substantive. So one of the things in the clinical encounter that I notice welling up in me is you know, if I'm working with a young man, you know, in his twenties, let's say, and they're in this place and they, they present even a fantasy of initiative to allow myself to delight in their initiative, to become excited about this idea of initiative that they have. And often for some reason, their environment seems to provide so little of that it's it's can bring them to tears that I think they're wonderful or what they're thinking about is wonderful and to be so explicit about it. So there's something also missing about that. And I wonder if that's also has to do with over-involved parents, the whole helicoptering parents 
where the parents are providing the initiative, they're identifying the correct impulse, and the kid doesn't even realize that they're not being asked necessarily or allowed to create initiative. And then when the parents kind of feel their job's done, mm -hmm. you know, then they're irritated that their kids aren't leaving their bedroom at 20 and 24 and 25 years old, but they haven't actually been given any space in the developmental window to identify some kind of initiative. And to struggle with themselves. Yes. Um, if, if the path and is laid out ahead of time by so-called providing adults, the flip side of that is it's depriving the child or the teenager or the young adult from developing his or her own muscle for how am I going to solve this problem? Oh my gosh, I just flunked calculus. Now what am I going to do? Or a breakup with a girlfriend or any one of a number of other things of versus you can do it. We're leaning into something here because Joseph, you're talking a lot about young men in their 20s. And there's a certain way where I'm not sure that I would quote unquote diagnose anyone as a puer in their 20s, because that's a time of life when it's developmentally appropriate not to be settled. But you're talking about you're seeing certain patterns and you're both lifting up these kinds of de developmental trajectories, maybe with certain parenting styles. And I wonder if you're both reaching into kind of, this is how a puer psychology might get formed by someone, for example, who's always had over-involved parents and didn't have a chance to develop their own agency. Yes. And we're trying to give living examples of, of what is the wrestling point so whether the wrestling point happens at 19 or 45, at 45 it feels more tragic, but it might be that they're still in this wrestling point. I mean, I've definitely seen a lot of people in my practice who were in their 30s and their 40s, their 50s, or even their 60s, who just had never come down to earth. And I'm imagining that with the young men that Joseph has in particular referenced, that there might be sort of the nascent beginning of that. And that when you mentioned, Lisa, that, you know, just because a, a young woman perhaps gets married and has a child, that following a, the, a, a sort of traditional, if you will, path doesn't necessarily mean that a person is coming down into earth mm -hmm. and incarnating. And then it sh shows up in more relief in the person's 30s, 40s, and even later in, in life, where there is a kind of inner barrenness, because something, a lot of some things have been missed. And part of what that can look like, I think, is a kind of sense of superficiality, that relationships are kind of superficial that interests are superficial, that everything has a kind of as if quality. Nothing feels really real or substantive. Right. And in the consulting room, that feels like, uh, as analysts, we're offering insights or interpretations, and nothing seems to make a difference. That maybe it's all just kind of humorous or delightful, but nothing seems to, to activate under the skin. Or there's this kind of terminal ambivalence where I really want to go get a job, but I, I just can't make myself. But I want to go get a job, but I just can't make myself. And it sort of never seems to shift. And that comes back to the idea of how are they evaluating the target? And again, coming back to the cost-benefit analysis or some strange alien thinking process which really doesn't capture anything about the soul or anything about the, a true emergent image inside of them. And then therefore there isn't any, it's not attractive. And, and they're kind of right in a way, they are giving feedback to us, to the world, to other people that I'm not finding anything inside of myself to really give a shit about. But yet I believe sincerely it's in there. Now, will they tolerate the dissent? to find it, you know, on their own or with an analyst or in a meditation class, you know, however you're going to go inside. And if they find it, will they tend it or will it be kind of a hot coal 
that they just kind of drop because it's going to, especially later in life, demand a tremendous amount of accommodation and restructuring. So I think about, you know, tarot, the tarot key 16, uh, the lightning struck tower. We can build this kind of structure in the life, which could be very alien to our nature. And that if the life of desire, if the legitimate images that are inhabiting the soul activate, there is this kind of conflagration and this kind of explosive deconstruction of the life, which is, of course, much more difficult when we're 40 and 50 because we have a lot more structures than we do when we're 20. And so people often shy away and fight to keep restoring the old structure, restoring the persona, restoring the old way. That goes to the idea of approaching the sacrifice, particularly later in life, where you actually have something to put on the altar. Yeah, maybe maybe we can wrap up with another really short quote from Marie-Louise von Franz <laughs> that's, I think, relevant here. She says, and to what you were saying, Joseph, she says, whatever one has within oneself but does not live grows against one. Yes. And I think what we're saying is that the Puer and the Puella have a lot within themselves that they don't allow to grow. And I wonder if we should switch to a dream. It sounds like it's time. Hi, this is Joseph from this Jungian Life podcast. Lisa, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing it involves substantial expenses, and now we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisjungianlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us with as little as a dollar a month. And at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. So today's dream, the dreamer is female and she's 43 years old and works at a nurse works as a nurse's aide and here's the dream. I was in a dark forest at night with my youngest son who's 10. We were standing at the top of an exterior staircase attached to a house which was situated at the edge of a large clearing in the forest. The house had bright spotlights shining onto the clearing and I could see small animals all wandering through it. I felt like I wanted to go into the forest, but had to wait for something. I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. A mountain lion had appeared on the edge of the clearing. As soon as it stepped into the clearing, it changed into a very large snake. It began slowly making its way through the clearing, killing the small animals. It was killing them, but not eating them. I saw it begin to devour a smaller poisonous snake. The large snake had its head tipped back in such a way that I could see it had a hole in the underside of its throat. So it was clamping the smaller snake with its teeth, swallowing and pulling it through its mouth. But the smaller snake was falling out through the hole in its neck back onto the ground. My son and I began to run down the stairs and skirt around the edges of the clearing. I needed to get into the forest at a certain location, and it was on the far side from the house. I stopped briefly when I noticed a dead kitten right at the edge of the forest. It had been ripped in half by the snake. Another kitten was there. It was so young, its eyes were not open. It was trying to crawl into the forest for safety. I felt like I was rooting for it, hoping for it to survive, but I had no urge to pick it up and help it. The large snake noticed us running. It changed back into the mountain lion and began after us before we could get to the far end of the clearing. I noticed a hunter's tree stand just inside the forest at the side of the clearing we had made it to. We ran for it. 
I kept checking to make sure my son was still with me. I began running up the stairs to the tree stand, and when I reached the top, noticed he was no longer with me. I panicked, began looking around. I noticed a black panther was now in the trees below the stand, jumping from branch to branch. The mountain lion was staying back because of it. The panther jumped up into the tree stand beside me and changed into my son. I keep forgetting I do not need to be afraid for you, I said to him. And then I woke. And she says, in terms of context, I've struggled badly with fears of abandonment my entire life. Lately, I feel as though the issue is coming to a head. I desperately want to change and grow in this area, but I can't seem to get past the hurdle of equating love with a need for feeling as though my presence is needed constantly by my loved ones. I fall into a pattern of anxiety that they are abandoning me, rejecting me, when in reality, it's just natural periods of ebbs and flows of contact. And when I ask what were the main feelings in the dream, she replies, at the start, caution, a knowledge of waiting for something to happen. Adrenaline once the snake was there, longing, hope, and sorrow when observing the kittens, panic, and then relief at the end with my son. And finally, she says, I feel like the main elements which stand out to me as holding meaning is the scene with the snake eating the smaller snake and the scene with the kittens. I don't feel like the main message has to do with any sort of motherly protectiveness toward my children, although I recognize that would be an easy route to go with analysis, but it just doesn't sit right. I wonder instead if my son is representing something for my unconscious. Wow, this is quite a dream. Uh, yeah, it is. It's like a short story kind of fairy tale uh, with, with the forest and the animals and the wildlife and the danger. And that's where the dream starts. I was in a dark forest at night with my youngest son, who is 10, there is the psychic situation, and I'm thinking about how dark forests are classic fairy tale images for being in the unknown, in the unconscious. And that's a real doubling, a dark forest, and furthermore, it's at night. Mm -hmm. With some part of her own psyche that is being imaged as a 10-year-old boy. And sometimes when there's a child or a baby in the dream, I will say, how old was the child? And in this case, we have that information. The child is 10. So I might ask the streamer, and what, obviously you had this child 10 years ago, but what else happened for you 10 years ago? You know, was there a change in attitude? Was there a change in the outer situation in some other way? Because this might be representing some new aspect of psychic life that's about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. I also ask about what happened in the dreamer's life when he or she was 10. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you? Did something overt happen or was it a difficult or interesting time for you? So here's this house that has all the spotlights shining into the clearing. And she says, I felt like I wanted to go into the forest, but had to wait for something. There's a real contrast between the house, which is a civilized or cultural kind of construct, versus the, the natural and wildish uh, appeal of the forest. Yeah, and the house has all these spotlights, yes. right? Consciousness and lights and electricity and... And also fear. You know, people put spotlights all around their house because they're afraid something unseen will approach the house and that they'll be protected by making sure that at any point during the night they can spot what's approaching. Yes. So it's a kind of a contrast between ego with the house and the spotlights versus the forest. And it's wild animals. Yeah, I like I like your uh, reference to fear there with the spotlights, Joseph, because it seems to me that it is an image of vigilance, isn't it? And that maps onto what she says about how she's sort of vigilant in her relationships for any sign that she's you know no longer important to her loved ones. And if we drop deeper, I mean that's the outer seeming of it. What is revealed in the psyche? is this rapacious 
creature that cannot be satisfied, which shows up in lots of fairy tales. There just isn't enough things that it can digest because it can't actually get it down its gullet. So it goes, it kills, which in a sense kind of paralyzes all the other possibilities. It's trying to eat them over and over again. And we could imagine with this hole in its throat, it's never satisfied. It actually never gets what it needs. And that the psyche, the dream ego, is becoming aware of the rapacious hunger, tries to flee it. And if we imagine that the sun is actually her, is a comment on her psychological relationship to her children, that this devouring, unresolvable hunger, when she flees from that, she kind of abandons her kids psychologically, perhaps, or maybe otherwise, and they have to resort to becoming panthers in order to kind of survive. That when the mother flees, they have to rely on their instincts to kind of get along in the world. She comes back and she has a moment to recognize that. And in a sense, the ego says, oh, I don't need to be afraid for you. I don't need to take care of you. But that could be a misunderstanding that the child might actually need an ongoing attendance. So when I sink down into the kind of uh, serpents and dragons and monsters that can never be satisfied, yes, it could very well be this uh, feeling of being unsoothed as a child and therefore abandoned later in life. And it can also mean uh, all kinds of addictions that the dreamer might be struggling with. She didn't mention that, but this is the kind of dream that somebody might have if they're struggling with a powerful addiction. I don't know if this will work, but I keep thinking about uh, the fairy tale Prince Lindworm. And in this fairy tale, the, this queen gives birth basically to twins. Uh, she was not supposed to have two children. She was supposed to only uh, have one as a result of eating this flower. But she greedily ate two flowers. And one of the twins was a monstrous snake, a lindworm. And it went slithering out of the uh, birth room and lived outside in the natural world somewhere. It had been abandoned and uh, rejected. And that's what the streamer says. She says, I've struggled with fears of abandonment my whole life. And later on, um, the lindworm appears and wants to get married and claim his right uh, as the elder son. But unfortunately, he keeps devouring all the brides that are selected for him <laughs> until uh, a young woman confronts him and, and flays him and penetrates all his tough outer skin and and tendency to just devour everything. And I'm wondering about that, if there's even a variation on something like that at the end, uh, where the Black Panther is there, and the Black Panther is fierce enough to scare away the mountain lion, jumps up into the tree and does confront the dream ego, who says, uh, I keep forgetting I don't need to be afraid for you. But I'm wondering if there needs to be something fierce, independent, and confrontational here uh, so that this element in the dreamer that is represented by the devouring snake can awaken into uh, a different state. I like where you're going, Deb, and, and um, I think I'm going to pick up on a little bit of what you both said. And Joseph, I think you're just right about the the snake is unable to fill itself, right? And I think that that probably does feel like her own kind of relational hunger, which can't be sated. But I also see it, I see that aspect of the dream also as uh, it makes me wonder if she has difficulty trusting her instincts. That they seem dangerous. Yes. Her instincts seem dangerous and are killing small animals and, and that sort of thing. Snakes are very instinctual and so are cats, you know, mountain lions and, and that sort of thing. I, I think I'm more on Deb's 
page than yours about our Black Panther. I, I think I see it if we're if we're going with that her son is perhaps an element of her psyche, then this lysis feels very positive to me that there there is a part of her psyche which is instinctual, which she can trust, which is lithe and is able to jump from branch to branch and nimbly change, you know, into her son, that she doesn't need to be afraid, that she can meet this kind of these inner frightening instincts with some helpful instinctual part of herself that helps her to master them or be in control or, or be in right relationship to them, really. I'm thinking, too, about uh, this theme of aggression running through it all of this horrible, you know, all of these animals are aggressive. Uh, the mountain lion, then it changes into a snake that uh, is rapacious and cannot be sated and just basically goes on a rampage of leaving these smaller, more vulnerable uh, dream image animals wounded or dead. A and I wonder if that's what's going on here, a wrestling with her own aggression uh, which is like the lindworm that was very aggressive until it was met with something that was sturdy and confrontational and could stand up to it. Uh, and that that's where the transformation lay. Uh, but it's as if the aggression here is very dangerous and bad. It's like she is afraid of her own needs yes. and her own anger would be my guess. That will be devouring but something's wrong with her instinctive level because it has this hole in it. It's a problem. It's just a problem. She runs for the hunter. I don't. I feel more curious about the end than positive about it necessarily because she's running for the hunter's stand, but she doesn't find him. Now, it might be positive that she's at least identified the hunter image as somebody who could meet wildness and respond to it appropriately if she could actualize her own animus, her inner huntsman, he might know what to do with all of this wildness rather than just flee it. But it's not there yet, but there might be a promise of it. And she's still in flight and everything's still pursuing her. The sun responds by kind of joining this world, this natural world, and potentially he could contend with these forces when he becomes a panther that he couldn't normally contend with when he's a boy. But at the end, you know, I don't actually think anything's resolved. I mean, she's still in the tension, which, which is reasonable. Also, this looks like a big conundrum. It's not going to be solved in one dream. What I find most helpful is that the rapacious hunger has been imaged. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the gift of the dream. The ego still doesn't know what to do with it. You know, maybe not being afraid was correct. Maybe that was just a defense against the anxiety. But be that as it may, you've got a serpent now. <laughs> you could be really imagining this um, problem inside of you as a serpent with a hole in its throat. You could talk to it. You could draw it the way Jung drew his monsters. And you might even have fantasies about what you would do with this dragon this serpent inside of you. And that could set in motion a kind of energetic shift. I mean, we don't know how you're going to uh, resolve it in the same way that, you know, a heroine in the middle of the journey, she's just, you know, depending on her wits and her instincts to kind of get her through this. But at least, you know, you have one image of the enemy. I want to just pick up on the image of the hunter's tree stand, because I think it, it's a nice counterpoint actually to the house because it's just inside the forest, but it's near to the clearing. So it's not all the way in the forest. And it is a man-made structure. A hunter's tree stand is a man-made structure. It's a place to hide and it's a little bit elevated. You're absolutely right about all the spotlights, Joseph. There's something almost kind of paranoid about that image. But being in a hunter's tree stand, you're sort of you're sort of ensconced there. You're in the forest. It, it's a nice intermediary place. It's a little bit of a different image, and it might show the possibility of a different kind of relationship with the unconscious. And it puts her in the role of a predator. I mean, if you've seen the stands, 
they're in this camouflage. They're sitting with their, you know, rifles poking out of this slot, sitting there drinking beer and waiting for something to come along that they can shoot, <laughs> you know, so that puts her in the realm of being a fellow predator. And although she doesn't identify with being a hunter, again, that animus potential, but it's still problematic that the sun becomes one of the creatures to me. I understand that it seems more perspective. It really depends on whether you're thinking it's an inner and outer sun and, and how you imagine the changeling situation. You know, that's the part that I'm interested in. That at the very end of the dream, there's a, a black panther. So that sort of um, echoes all these images of forest and darkness and night. And it's a different thing from a mountain lion. One might think, isn't a mountain lion enough? I mean, why do we need a different kind of a cat? And what interests me, <laughs> and this may be uh, really reaching, is that the word panther, if you divvy it up, turns into pant and her. And I kept thinking about somebody who's wearing the pants, something there about a panther and this final meeting. I mean, there is a meeting of the dream ego and this creature. That is what the dream says. It's not that everything is necessarily resolved, but I like that the sun has, has power here uh, and changes back into the sun, uh, who is smaller and younger and a 10-year-old, and that she doesn't need to be afraid for him anymore or for that part of her. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of fear in this dream. So something about the last line being, I don't need to be afraid for you feels significant. Yes. Joseph is still not buying it. Yeah, I, I, what I love about our conversations <laughs> is that there's all these lenses, you know, yes. and we all have yeah. our pet lens, yep. you know, <laughs> that we just yeah, know. don't feel gratified by. Right, so. but, Joseph, but mine is right. <laughs> uh, and, and, and it is right, honey. <laughs> Thank you. Now, so this dream has induced a little wildness in us. <laughs> yes, uh, we're all contending woodland creatures right now. Uh, and I think we're going to leave it there for now. <laughs> I think so. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, Help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.